Alright guys, my name is Meta Goblin, and today we're going to be counting down the top 10 things you need to know before you play Classic TBC. We're going to be covering a number of extremely useful time-saving tips to improve your quality of life when playing the game. If you don't learn all these tips, you're probably going to be kicking yourself at some point when you realise just how much time you've wasted playing the game when you could have done something more efficiently. Just before we jump in guys, if you end up liking the video or want to see more videos like it, please consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell because that really does help me out. You can also follow me on Twitch if you want to catch any of my live streams. Anyway, let's jump on to my first point, which is don't focus on getting to level 70. I know I sound crazy, but getting to level 70 shouldn't be your primary focus when Classic TBC releases, because there's no point getting to level 70 and having no reputation farmed, because then you're just, you're just going to be stuck there having to farm loads and loads of reputation when you could have done it while you're leveling. For me, whenever I re-roll on a private server, getting to level 70 is honestly a side goal. Okay, because you're going to have to farm so much rep at level, level 70 anyway, you may as well kill two birds with one stone. You're going to need to get all these reputations grinded up to unlock all the heroic dungeons and to get all of your achievements done. So you may as well do them at the same time, which leads me on to my second point, farm dungeons low level. When you're low level, for instance like 60 to 65, dungeons like Hellfire Ramparts, Blood Furnace, Slave Pens and Underbog will give you a decent amount of reputation but when you get higher level, they stop giving you reputation. Well, it changes to only giving you one rep per kill, which is incredibly inefficient. So to me, it makes sense to simultaneously grind your experience up while also farming your reputation. You will only be able to benefit from reputation games of these dungeons up until Honored, and then you'll have to move on to the higher level dungeon, for instance, Shattered Halls or Steam Vaults to get more rep. So when you get to Honored, then you should move on to a different dungeon. You should definitely save quests for later for when there's no dungeon groups. I always do quests at our last resort because if you can always do a dungeon group, you should do a dungeon group when you're level 70 and farming rep. And then I normally grind quests when there's like no dungeon groups going, so I'm always being very efficient with farming my rep. And obviously, if you do quests and save them to level 70, you will actually gain more money from the quest rewards, which is really good. My third point is pretty similar to the second point, you want to do Karazhan Achievement early. Okay, so at level 70 you need to do Karazhan Achievement, which involves a few quests in Deadwind Pass, and then you have to do a total of five dungeon runs. So again, why not kill two birds with one stone? While you're doing your Karazhan Achievement, you will also be simultaneously farming experience all the way from level 68 to 70. It's a very long quest line with a number of really good quest XP because it's dungeon quest XP, which is obviously always boosted. So the amount of XP you get is really big from doing the whole achievement quest line. And then every single dungeon that you do will also have quests attached to that dungeon for even more experience. So you do actually end up doing a ridiculous amount of quests doing a Karazhan achievement, which if you did them at level 70, you'd be getting zero experience. You may as well do them at level 68 and yeah, like I said, kill two birds with one stone. The dungeon quests attached to these you know, dungeons, will also give really, really good gear. A lot of the time, it is pre-raid best in slot gear, and if it isn't, it'll definitely be a close second. Whenever I play on fresh private servers, obviously you don't start with classic raiding gear. So what I do, obviously, is I do the Karazhan achievement level 60, and by the time I'm done with the Karazhan achievement, I'm basically level 70, and I've got loads of, I've got half of my pre-raid best in slot gear farmed. And if you put it in perspective, a lot of people are going to be running into classic TBC with really good classic WoW raiding gear. You're just basically going to be have you probably have all of your pre-raid best in slot gear by combining all the great gear you get from the Karazhan achievement quest line with all the gem slots and everything, and combine that with tier three gear. You're ready to jump into a raid straight away. And there's no time wasting at all. Second, you get to level seventy, you can do Karazhan. Fourthly, you will need a flying mount, so you need it to get inside of the dungeon Architraz for the Karazhan achievement, so you basically cannot do Karazhan achievement without a flying mount, unless you can get a warlock to summon you up to the Architraz, depending on whether Blizzard are going to prevent that from, you know, happening or not. You'll also need it for the Tempest Keep raid, and all of the dungeons attached to Tempest Keep. You'll also need it to attune for SSC, because you can't do SSC 
without doing Karazhan, you need to kill Night Bane and Karazhan, so another thing. You also needed to unlock a daily quest if you're going to farm all of your daily quests to get a really cool flying mount if you want to go through that. And you also needed to do some particular group quests in Shadow Moon Valley and Neverstorm, which provide you pre raid best in slot gear like the Terran Gorfine questline, which I definitely recommend doing by the way. For number five, profession meta change. So engineering no longer is the king overpowered profession in classic TBC. The professions are considerably more balanced. Um, there's some exceptions to that, obviously, because level working is probably the most useful profession for raiding because of the drums of battle. It provides a little mini heroism or bloodlust for the entire group, which is really useful. Most classes that can benefit from level working will be expected to get it for drums. In more serious guilds, it may even be the case that all classes in that guild, everyone in that guild, will have to get level working for those drums which will be not so great in my opinion, but we're not really talking about that in this video. Moving on, all the gear crafting professions, blacksmithing, tailoring, everything, they are useful from the start to finish of the expansion. They aren't just like useful to get some pre-raid best in slot gear like they were in classic TBC. You know, new recipes come out with the new raid tiers, so basically the profession gear upgrades as it goes along. And some pre-raid best in slot craftable gear will last you two raid tiers because it's so ridiculously useful because of the set bonuses it provides. For instance, Spell Strike and Frozen Shadow Weave gear. There's also a drastic class meta change, okay? Warriors and Rogues are no longer the top dog DPS in classic TBC. In instead, the top space is taken by Hunters and Warlocks. Meme specs become that were meme specs in classic WoW become viable support specs with really fun playstyles. I definitely encourage you to try out those specs because they're really good to play. And obviously it's it's important to bear in mind that if you're going to roll into cl classic TBC as a rogue or warrior, it may be difficult for you to get a raid spot, especially as warriors and rogues are so ridiculously overpopulated in classic TBC. It'll be interesting to see how that turns out. I have a video giving my recommendations of what to do as a warrior or rogue. You can go and check that out on my channel. For number seven, my advice is to stack hit and spell hit gear. So you can actually get really good spell hit and hit gear from basic quest rewards while leveling, which will give you a fat stat, you know, chunk of spell hit, which is going to be extremely useful for when you do jump into raiding, especially if you decided to re-roll your class for classic TBC and you don't have any good raid gear with hit gear on it. Obviously it goes about saying that hit gear massively increases your DPS because if you don't have enough hit chance you won't even be able to fully benefit from all the other stats like haste and crit. For example the warlock requirement is a really hefty 202 spell hit points so it's definitely needed. Um, you definitely do need to be stacking hit gear as a warlock because it's very difficult to get that cap before you jump into Karazhan. Honestly most warlocks don't do it. And they mainly don't do it because they don't keep spell hit gear from quest rewards. Just a bonus tip guys, you can go for two really useful spell hit trinkets. First of all we have the Star Killer's Bauble which is a quest start item that drops from the congealed horror in Neverstorm. So you kill this mob, it's an elite mob, you need someone to help you do it. And then the quest item that drops instantly turns in to the Star Killer's Bauble which is a really good spell power cooldown trinket and spell hit trinket, and apart from that you've also got the Taroka's Tablet of Vim, which is a group quest uh, called Torgos in the Taroka Forest. This one also provides a really good melee attack power trinket for, you know, warriors and rogues and enhancement shamans and rep paladins. Maeve point is very similar to the previous point because what you need to do is start to get to know what your actual pre-raid best in slot gear is because some pre-raid best in slot gear could be basic greens that you get from quest rewards. It's more likely to be blue gear that you get from group quests, but nonetheless you do need to be mindful of it because you could be intending to roll a resto druid in TBC, but obviously leveling in feral spec is better, so you're mindlessly just getting like the best agility gear and attack power gear, but those quest rewards that you missed could have been your pre-raid best in slot gear for a resto druid, so definitely be mindful of that. So for number 9, we have a point that I want to make about how to get powerful weapon enchants early. This is a bit of a weird one because this quite literally, this is no joke, this came, this idea came to me last night in a dream. And I got up this morning to obviously research and test it, 
and it is a genuinely really useful tip um, to get your you know powerful weapon enchant early. So there are obviously some really powerful weapon enchants that drop from Karazhan bosses like Mongoose and Soulfrost, things like that. They have a hefty requirement of 12 void crystals, okay? So that's 12 pieces of epic gear that you have to disenchant. So you're gonna have to wait until 12 epic pieces of gear drop from a particular raid. And obviously it's gonna be difficult because unless you're your guild's designated disenchanter it's just going to take you ages to get these powerful weapon enchants for yourself it already takes long enough because you have to wait for these recipes to actually drop in the first place but luckily there's actually something very easily you can do i definitely recommend working with people in your guild to do this because you can disenchant soul cloth shoulders to get really easy void crystals you don't just have to use this particular recipe because all of the soul cloth gear has is extremely cheap to make and well, it's basically the cheapest epic piece of gear that I've found so far that you can make because all it requires is Soul Essence combined with Neverweave Cloth combined with Rune Thread. And Soul Essence just drops from all of the undead spectral enemies in Karazhan. And most people just kind of put it on the auction house anyway. At the moment on my server, it's like 74 silver per item. So an extremely cheap reagent to get, especially when you can turn it very easily into a Void Crystal. The recipe for the uh, soul cloth gear does actually drop from Karazhan as well. It has a 10% chance to drop from all of the spectral ghosts that are in Karazhan. It's very likely to drop um, one or two runs. You're definitely going to see it at least once or um, another piece of the gear, not just for shoulders. And even if it doesn't drop, what you can do is just trash farm with your guild if you know if you're really really unlucky so overall it's a very useful tip to get void crystals very early within the you know the first two weeks or even a month of the launch obviously about after a month or so you will start to see void crystals appear in the auction house um, for fairly cheap but then this won't become a good like gold flipping method but nonetheless you can obviously farm all of the reagents to create soul cloth gear off your own back you know, just by doing Karazhan simultaneously, you're getting the real reagents, soul essences. Could even be cheeky and ask everyone to just trade you them because most people just vendor them anyway. And then you can find me never weave in the open world. So it's a very free and easy way to just keep getting void crystals, again, to then use on your powerful weapon enchants. And lastly, uh, we have the point of picking the correct Shatterer faction. Obviously, I'm talking about the Aldor of Ascryers. I will make a more detailed video about this in the future, but the shorthand of it is ranged spellcasters should go Scryers because of the spell hit gem, the spell damage ring, and the spell damage tailing recipe, although you can just buy that off somebody else, you know, anyway. Feral Druids probably will also go for Scryers for the hit chance legs. And then everyone else pretty much just goes Aldor, okay, because tanks will definitely need the chest item because it provides so much defense rating and gets you to that avoidance cap much, much faster. And then overall the uh, shorter enchants are better for most classes on the Aldor side. I wouldn't be surprised if people didn't really pick the Aldor of Ascryers for their actual gear items because they'll look at their own really good classic wild raiding gear and decide, well, it isn't that much of an improvement for the game I've already got, so I may as well go for the long term and just pick the faction based on the best shoulder enchant for my class. So again, I'll make a more detailed video about that in the future. But anyway guys, that's where I'm going to end the video there. My name is Medigoblin, until my next video, ciao.